welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, member of the State Senate, live on Big Island where I practice emergency medicine. Today I have the luxury of having a good friend on the program, Ms. Ann Lopez. She is the Chief Operating Officer of HHSC, which is Hawaii Health Systems Corporation, and is also their General Counsel. Ann was formerly with the Attorney General's Office, where I worked very closely with her. I found her to be a terrific intellect, and I'm excited that she's working on a big issue for us, which is our healthcare safety net. So for those of you who haven't watched our show before, uh, HHSC acts as uh, kind of the bedrock, the foundation of our healthcare system, especially on the neighbor islands. So today we're going to talk about our healthcare safety net, HHSC. Nice to see you, Ann. Nice to see you. So thanks for coming on. Uh, on many occasions I've been able to speak with um, our leadership at HHSC because at the legislature, but statewide, people are very concerned about making sure everyone has access to health care. Mm -hmm. So could you give us a little, um, kind of give us the primer on what is HHSC, if, you know, if other people haven't seen this program? Okay. Well, HHSC uh, originally started over 20 years ago as Hawaii's community health system. Um, and as a safety net, what it did was ensure that on the neighbor islands in particular, that uh, people who live in Hawaii had access to health care to their basic needs in health care. Um, in 1996, the legislature changed the structure a little bit to turn it into a more autonomous sort of corporation so that it could be more flexible and respond to the demands and changes in health care. Right. Um, over the last 20 years, it's really evolved into a very complex and sophisticated health care system. Um, we have 12 facilities statewide and uh, two facilities on Oahu, but primarily on the neighbor islands. Right. And uh, we provide care from really birth to death um, and, um, and everything in between. So uh, the facilities, um, we, we call them a safety net, but they really have grown well beyond a safety net. Sure. They provide modern day health care to uh, the residents and visitors. Right. So, yeah, so Hawaii Health System Corporation, this corporation with these 12 hospitals, I think that the people in the neighbor islands really understand and appreciate how valuable they are. Mm -hmm. On my island, on Big Island, you've got the main facilities, Kona Hospital mm -hmm. in my district, uh, Hilo Hospital, right. and then we have some smaller facilities, right? We've got Kau Hospital and Kohala Hospital where I do some right. PR work. Uh, in addition, there's one private hospital, North Hawaii Community Hospital. Right. Um, separate from the system. Uh, so I think people under, need to understand that almost the entirety of the health care that you get on Big Island is HHSC. Right. And then Maui. Maui has one major hospital, correct? Right. It is. HHSC is the only hospital on the island of uh, Maui. We also have a hospital on Lanai. Yes. And a smaller hospital on Maui as well in Kula. Got it. So, so people on Oahu, I think, might not understand because they have Straub and they've got Queens and they've got mm -hmm. Castle, uh, though we do have the HHSC facilities on Oahu, right. providing mostly long-term care, correct? Yes. Uh, but for the neighbor islanders, that's the game. That's where you go. Now, how many employees is, is this? I mean, how, how big are these facilities for our viewers? The, our total em employee count is just over 4,100 right. employees. Um, and I, I think that probably East Hawaii has about 1,200 yeah. of those. Maui total, including Lanai and Kula, is probably about 1,400. Um, and then Kona and Kauai are the next two largest employers. Kauai has yeah. two facilities. Um, in addition, there's uh, a third hospital there as well um, by another private provider. See, it's so I try to tell people that not only is this where you're going to go to get your health care, but also in many cases, these are the best jobs in the district, in mm -hmm. the region where these hospitals are. A lot of very um, important high-tech jobs. All of the health care professionals there, the nurses mm -hmm. and the doctors and the workers at the hospitals, I mean, these are... These are really an essential piece of the culture of Hawaii, which I think should not be lost on people. It's also a big economic uh, piece of Hawaii, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Could you give us a little bit of an overview on the scope of HHSC, like how, how big it is? Because I know a lot of our viewers are interested in, well, they hear 
we sometimes have a subsidy. We want to be supportive of healthcare for all. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? But if you know, if people are watching us today, I hope they'll come away with the understanding that you actually generate a lot of revenue. In fact, most of the revenue for the system. Correct? Absolutely. And uh, I think in this last year, our revenues uh, increased to a little over five hundred and fifty million dollars. Wow. And. I'm not sure if you can see it on yeah. the TV, but uh, this shows how much our revenues have increased. Amazing. So uh, this says this shows from about 200 million back in '98 right. up now, because healthcare is expensive and mm -hmm. um, technology is driving healthcare costs, as are many things, of course, pharmacy and it's expensive to pay for healthcare. We're now up, like you just said, over 550 million dollars, which. Right. Wow, that's a gigantic number. And much of this revenue comes from people just paying their insurance and... Right. The, lar the largest portion of our payer is Medicare and Medicaid. Right. And that actually leads to where some of the difficulties um, HHSC experiences because there's always a gap between how much we're reimbursed for, from Medicaid and Medicare right. and the cost of the care that we provide. Yeah. And it's that gap, really, uh, between our reimbursements and the cost of care that have required HHSC to go to the legislature to seek um, basically gap funding, a subsidy to, to fill that gap between uh, our reimbursements yeah, and I our think, expenses. I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, people have insurance. Uh, we right. have 1.4 million people in the state. But many, many people now in our state, uh, the number I last heard uh, was 345,000 of our individuals, of our citizens, have Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Then another 100-some thousand people have Medicare. So right. that, that's probably almost pushing a half a million people of the state, of the 1.4 million people, have Medicare or Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Virtually all of these individuals, at some time or another, will go to an HHSC hospital, very likely. Some might go to some of the other hospitals, but if you're on the neighbor islands, you go to the HHSC hospitals. Right. Tell people or help me to express to people what the difference is as far as payments between if you've just got private insurance and your HMSA or Kaiser insurance versus you're on Medicaid and what's the reimbursement like? Well, I think probably if we look at Medicaid, I, probably the easiest calculation is to look at long-term care. Okay. Because we have a flat reimbursement of, I, I think it's $200 yes. a day. And the cost of care is $400 a day. Got it. So there's no way to fill that gap. We can't decrease the number of staff working right. with our patients. Right. Um, it, there's just no way to bridge that gap. Yeah. You can't cut any more corners. And so we will always have that $200 gap. Now, it's not the same 200 for every kind of service that's provided, sure. but I think that that gives the clearest example of. Oh, I, I know, because well, one time I had a gentleman who came in and cut off part of his finger, which I reattached. And, <laughs> and I'm not complaining, because I'm not into money. I really mm -hmm. do not worry about this personally. I just want to be a doc and do my job. But the reimbursement was like $19 from a Medicaid reimbursement for reattaching a person's finger. And I just wanted to make sure his finger worked. Right. And that individual was just in a circumstance where he uh, didn't have a lot of resources. But by the same token, the costs at the facility were very large. And that's why when people use the word safety net, um, we're talking about a place where people can go and get good care, get safe care, get a full complement of care, x-rays, and mm -hmm. a doc, and a nurse, and a team. Uh, but the costs were very, very large probably to do the surgery and to take care of all the needs right. of the patient. And I think that people have to understand that that's why, in some cases, government services exist, because if we were just left to our own devices to simply prop up private facilities mm -hmm. exclusively for Medicaid, no one would come into the business. I don't right. think. I, I don't think and, it's possible. And we treat every single person, so nobody gets turned away. Yeah. And um, so that certainly adds to the gap for us, and um, we will continue to do that. You did touch on something that I think is really important, and that is technology. And surprisingly, technology is eating up huge amounts of resources at this point. Yeah. And, and a large part of that is driven by 
uh, every hospital, not just HHSC, every, every hospital's uh, need to comply with federal and state laws, and they require certain kinds of reporting, record keeping, and all of that rests on uh, a complex yeah. IT system. And everybody knows what it looks like. It's when you go to the doctor and they give you a pill, they now scan the pill and it goes right into your billing, right into your medical record. Yeah. Those systems are uh, just enormously expensive and really drain the cost. Yeah, you, you touch a nerve with me when you mention that and you know, we're friends and so it's not about me and you, but I'll, I'll tell you, I was trained in family practice back in, not that long ago. I mean, I graduated from medical school uh, in 1997 and when I graduated in family practice for my residency, it was really about seeing a lot of people, taking care of their primary care needs, writing a quick note, and moving in a way <laughs> to take care of people, the, the next person. And uh, the system has changed, you mm -hmm. know, and to place blame would be, un, you know, probably indelicate, but it's certainly not HHSE's fault. But when additional regulations come down, and I'm not talking about holding people to account for good care, but when the focus becomes documentation at all mm -hmm. costs and um, scanning this and that and making sure an electronic medical record is available if you want to even file your bills, it makes it impossible to deliver care the way we were trained, which right. was it was about the patient and um, his or her doc mm -hmm. or nurse in, in many cases. And I really, I personally, we won't dwell on this today, but I think we took the wrong fork in the road when we looked at healthcare um, systems reform, because for all of the extraordinarily big pluses to erase mistakes and mm -hmm. this and that, I think that we depersonalized so much of healthcare, and a lot. I think a lot more resource could have been put into people, because I mean, I'm sure you guys spend millions and millions of dollars on the electronic medical record system. Mm -hmm. Yet I also know you're always looking for enough staff just to see people. Right. And I wonder. I wonder if that's at least not the place to start for the next iteration of the next Health Care Act, whatever right. that might be. Well, I will tell you the flip side of it, though, yes. is that as a result of our electronic medical records, our revenue cycle has been vastly improved. Well, so we are able to bill on a more timely basis, yeah. collect on a more timely basis. And so part of the revenues, when you see that bar going up, yeah. part of it is, is because the electronic process has improved our ability to go after the money that we should be getting reimbursed. Right, and that, and there is value, obviously, <laughs> there. You're talking to a guy There's that... There's pros and cons yeah, to it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm a guy that could almost lean towards a single-payer model, so I, I right. hear you. But, I yeah, I think that it's it's very relevant to have a good, s stable system. I would have loved to have seen one national system that mm -hmm. everyone could have utilized without kind of all the angst about this one versus that and com these competitors that wanted, of course, to, you know find their place in the healthcare system, right. but often at a very high cost. But that's, it is very good news. And I know I want to give you guys some kudos right off the bat. Um, incredible amount of credit to you, to Linda Rosen, who I just think is, you know, terrific, uh, and past CEOs as well. Uh, it's a big challenge to never turn someone away, to always put their healthcare needs first before worrying about the revenue, before worrying mm -hmm. about, um, you know the complexities of the system, and it's kept a lot of people alive. I mean, I've worked, I've worked for now, uh, boy, I want to say at least 11 years uh, doing ER shifts uh, in and out of the HHSC mm -hmm. system, and I can't even tell you how many people have come back and said nice things about quickly getting their heart attack diagnosed mm -hmm. because you kept the facilities open. And without Yeoman's effort, I don't know how it would have been done. Right. Well, I haven't been at HHSC very long, so I can't take very much credit. Uh, I will say that Dr. Rosen has uh, really brought something to HHSC that uh, is making a big difference. I, she, she's a physician first, yes. and she's a businesswoman second, and she's familiar with the state government and the state health system. And that combination of experience and skills, I think, has turned her into a really vibrant leader. And, and you can see the people believing that she recognizes the mission and puts the mission first. Yeah, she was exactly the right person at the right time, having come off mm -hmm. of a, a brief stint as director of health. And I knew in Linda when we, you know, a couple of us recommended her for that position and encouraged them to, to think about her. 
that because she had experienced building the trauma system mm -hmm. for HHSC and because right. she actually knew the facilities, she'd be a good choice. So we're, we're here at the end of our first 15 minutes. Why don't okay. we take a brief break and we come back, we'll talk about the regions and what they offer to the people of the state of Hawaii. Great. Okay. I'm Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii, joined today by Ann Lopez, who's the Chief Operating Officer of our healthcare system. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope that you will tune in and watch the show. It is inspiring and uplifting and educational also. We talk with artists of all different ilk. We talk with them about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, most dear to my heart, why they do it. And it, it never ceases to be fascinating when you get the answer to that question. I hope you'll join us on Center Stage, 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoons. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island. I'm joined uh, by a friend today, Ann Lopez, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Hawaii Health System Corporation, our healthcare safety net backbone, call it what you will, for the neighbor islands. They've got 12 facilities statewide. They were created over 20 years ago now to make sure that we have healthcare access in a hospital setting, both long-term care and acute care across our islands. So I'm happy to have you. Thank you for the invitation. You bet. So in our first uh, segment, you were talking very eloquently about uh, how budgets have increased, how the revenue stream has increased to over $550 million. Over 4,000 of Hawaii's individuals, citizens, are employed at HHSC. And really, that we don't ever turn anybody away. So whether someone's got Medicaid or Medicare or private insurance, it doesn't matter. They will be seen and get health care. Mm -hmm. We always hope top quality health care, affordable in a kind of a timely fashion, wherever you are. Right. But there's been some change in the last year. Uh, I've been in the legislature now for a decade, a little bit more, and it, you know, year over year over year there had been this debate. Should uh, government be in the role of health care? Should we be partially or completely running hospitals? What's your feeling about that? Well, I, it, it's a really complex issue because there's not a, the government should be in or the government should be out sort of bright line that we can take. HHSC started, and I think most community hospitals are like this, where it truly is a safety net. Yeah. Um, but what a safety net is, is sort of subject to some debate. Yeah. And um, you know, Dr. Rosen sort of describes it as a long time ago, you couldn't get a vaccination from a private doctor. So the government stepped in and gave vaccinations. And they did that until other hospitals or private providers could do vaccinations, right. and then the, the government withdrew. And so if we think about the, the safety net being, is if there's no other provider out there to provide something, the government should step in to make sure it's available. Right, yeah, and we have this, just so people understand, we need roads. No one is gonna put up a big road, right, in their community, because right. it's gonna cost tens of millions of dollars, so the government builds a road. A hospital in Kau, which will see everybody, which is where I started. I, I came to Hawaii in 2000 and I worked in Kau Hospital. Oh. And in the, well, I worked in the little clinic just down the street, but I would mm -hmm. volunteer and, and moonlight in the, in the little ER down there. There's no way it could stay open right. given the population. Yet thousands and thousands of tourists came through and local people lived there. And a lot of them didn't have money for gas, but they still could have a baby or they still could have a a terrible injury to their hand or something right. in their eye or heart attack, we wanted to provide care. Without the state and HHSC, they would have had to drive 70 miles up to Hilo mm -hmm. and wait several hours because of them far away and be away from their homes. So HHSC is in that space. Right. Um, so so yeah. fast forward now to a community like Maui, yes. where the community has grown and has grown to the point where it actually can sustain a private provider, a yeah. private hospital. 
uh, or and and that's where I think the debate started in yes. Maui was um, should the Maui facilities be transferred to a private provider? Mm -hmm. And that debate did go on for several years in the legislature until last year when the bill was passed. Right. And, uh, and I think that the, the debate is going to continue, sure. uh, not just as Maui makes this transition, right. but with respect to the other regions right. in the HHSC system. And it's a, it's a conversation that communities need to have. Um, because if the community can sustain a private provider, right. the options for um, a, 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 a greater variety of treatments mm -hmm. or different kinds of access to health care that you might not have in the HHS system, um, are a great, there's a greater potential for that to happen, generally because the private providers have much more flexibility in terms of their ability to react to the economic situations, um, the changes in the health care law. Yeah. And so they're, because they're more flexible, they can make those changes faster. Um, as opposed to, for instance, HHSC following the procurement law in, in terms of trying to get a change to its IT system or something. And, yeah. and so that conversation is important. I, I'll tell you with Maui where we're at with that right now Please. is last year the governor signed Act 103, which right. allows uh, the Maui facilities to be transferred to a private provider. And what this transfer means is basically that the state, the government, is yeah. getting out of the hospital business in the county of Maui. Mm -hmm. um, it's not asking anybody to manage the system right. or operate it on its behalf. It's getting out of the business. And uh, through the process, through Act 103, Kaiser, the Maui Regional System Board for right. HHSC, um, chose, after a vetting process, chose Kaiser Hospital to uh, be the provider on, in the Maui region. And I think, as you know, the governor just signed the transfer agreement two weeks ago, right. which uh, provides the sort of the structure for what's going to happen. Sure. Um, and it, it's really exciting. What's important for people to know is that this will always be a community hospital. This yeah. will not be, or Maui Memorial and Lanai and Kula, yeah. they will not be Kaiser hospitals only serving Kaiser patients. They will continue to be community hospitals serving everybody in the community. I think that's a very good point that you make because I think uh, a lot of people have been asking, hey, mm -hmm. I have a different insurance than Kaiser. Can I right. still go to my hospital? And the answer is yes. Yes. Those those organizations, they will do a contract with one another, and mm -hmm. if some doctor who has a HMSA patient or a UHA patient, and that person has an appendicitis or a strep throat or is going to deliver a baby, they can do it. Exactly. And they can work at the hospital. And in fact, Kaiser already has doctors working at the hospital. Right. So uh, this sort of relationship has has existed already. It's just going to exist at a, a much different level at this point. Tell me this. Uh, one, of the, one part of the debate that I was personally interested in and concerned about was whether or not we should have a mainland partner. Some mm -hmm. mainland partners had been interested in different times in bidding or coming and taking over a hospital or managing a hospital. Uh, a concern that was expressed repeatedly over, to, over and over again to me, and which I kind of took to heart, was if someone comes from out of state and then after a series of years decides it wasn't for them and leaves, could that leave a, a vacuum of services? Mm -hmm. Now, was that part of the consideration to have you know, Kaiser, who's very well established? I know that they were competing, I, I guess, with Hawaii Pacific Health. Mm -hmm. Very good, both very good organizations. Um, both provide a lot of great, you know, top quality, mm -hmm. you know, first world care to people. But having a, 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 an entity that was local, did that matter or was that irrelevant? Well, in Act 103, the legislature actually required any facility um, seeking to, to take over the system in Maui to have a certificate of need already in yeah. the state. And so that, that provision basically meant that only hospitals currently existing or working, yeah. you know, in the state could apply. Now, Kaiser, of course, is a national sure. mainland corporation. Right. And so um, 
it's kind of a hybrid of what people were looking for. There, there was this idea that we should keep uh, the facilities operated and run by local entities. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that comes from a sense of um, Hawaii is very different than the mainland. Yeah. And, uh, and you probably can talk about this, but you probably see uh, some issues in our rural areas that are absolutely never seen on the mainland or very rarely seen. For sure. Well, boy, I mean, we have a, a dengue outbreak. I mean, you know, right. and uh, it is helpful, I could tell you, um, having been on both sides of this fence, mm -hmm. to have some experience locally. Uh, I remember when I started practice in 2000, for the first year at least, I was completely unfamiliar. I was a very young doc then, but uh, fresh out of residency. But I was very unfamiliar with some of the, um, just the cultural nuance, which was mm -hmm. very, very important. Right. I can tell you uh, a good example might be, uh, at first I was very dismayed when I saw uh, young women pregnant. Really dismayed, because they were very young and it, uh, they were still in high school. And uh, I thought, well, boy, we should be doing a better public health job, much better public health job in this little rural community on that issue. And I still feel, you mm -hmm. know, my personal biases wait a little bit until you got your life all together. But then I began to realize that in our culture, a family was so uh, prioritized. And in many cases, people did start families younger because we are very far away from urban centers, mm -hmm. that um, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of cultural, uh, there were cultural and traditional practices that people did get married sometimes before they had their education, still got their education mm -hmm. afterwards. And I realized that my bias was not completely appropriate uh, at that time. And that wasn't even a clinical question, but right. it mattered to learn that over the years. And I think if people come from the mainland to run our whole system, that learning curve might take some time. And I, I don't know if they would have necessarily the staying power. So I was glad to see mm -hmm. some continuity, I guess. Well, but let me also point out, I mean, it may be a company coming from the mainland, but um, the people who, whoever comes in, yes. The only people they can hire to do those jobs yeah. are the people who live and work in those areas. Right. And I don't see a mainland company bringing in a whole new crew to go live in some of our more rural areas. That was, that was one of the fallacies of some of the early proposals I saw. And I, when I was chairing the, the health committee a couple of years ago, um, and the bill didn't pass, and people said, well, why wouldn't you bring in a, a very deep-pocketed uh, company that promises the world and they're going to take, you know, they're going to take all the staff and transplant them here. I, I really kind of laughed myself because I knew that that was not real. Having tried to deal with the healthcare shortage over and over and over again, and we've discussed it at length on our program, mm -hmm. uh, people don't just get up and move to Hawaii. You really have to grow individuals, professionals here. You could bring a few people over, uh, and there is this paradise uh, phenomenon where people think, oh, I'll go to Hawaii and suddenly start my career, but it's pretty tough. About half the people go back, and mm -hmm. you invest a lot in people when they come and they learn to work in your hospital system or your clinic, and if they come for a year and a half and then leave, you've made an incredible professional investment that you now don't have the benefit right. of. We need people to be here and stay here and work for a long time to not just make uh, people safe, but also to make the health economics work, I think. Right, and that's what we're seeing on the Big Island, and you're probably really aware yeah. of this on the Big Island, in Hilo in particular, yeah. um, and in West Hawaii, finding um, family practitioners yeah. um, is very difficult, and internists is just very difficult. In West Hawaii, I know, it struggles with that yeah. all the time. Yes. And what physicians they have had are beginning to retire, yeah. and there aren't new young physicians coming in to take over those practices. Yes. Again, that becomes, that becomes a financial drain on HHSC because we need to bring doctors in, and it is a big investment yeah. to uh, bring in a physician to try and get them to get a practice set up. And then they need to be there a while to develop the practice and get it to a point where it's self-sustaining. Well, in my first year, in the first several months, I was seeing an average of eight people a day because people didn't know me. They didn't. Mm -hmm. and appropriately so they couldn't trust me they didn't know right. where I was coming from after the course of about 18 months when I had developed a good reputation I would have 32 people on my schedule every single day 
Right. I mean, I could have seen 60 people in a day if it was physically possible based on the need of many people not having health care in a mm -hmm. rural area. So, and what you say actually touches on many subjects uh, that we've had to deal with legislatively and from a policy standpoint. It's one of the reasons why um, we see a lot more people being becoming primary care providers that are in nursing disciplines and physician mm -hmm. assistant disciplines and why a lot of the dialogue that's going on about healthcare transformation has to do with a team where in some cases pharmacists, in some cases um, uh, dietitians will deliver a good portion of your healthcare, mm -hmm. each to the top of their license and their degree, but as part of a team because you really Unlike 1950 and 1960, <laughs> you simply don't go and always see the doc who is a white guy with a stethoscope. Right. Now it's, it's a very multicultural experience and mm -hmm. it's a team experience. So I think this is, again, the time is flying. We're at another break. Already. We are. <laughs> but when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the regions and your vision for healthcare uh, for our system. Great. Okay. Again, this is Josh Green. I'm your host for Healthcare in Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha, and bye-bye. Aloha. Welcome back once again to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, ER doc in the Big Island, and today I'm talking to Ann Lopez, who's a good friend, works at uh, HHSC as its chief operating officer. That's Hawaii Health Systems Corporation. They provide healthcare to all the people of Hawaii, but specifically on the neighbor islands. Their budget and revenues exceed $500 million every year now. They employ over 4,000 people, and they deliver care to anyone who comes and needs it. In the last year, they were in the headlines because Maui Memorial has begun a new process of management with Kaiser. Kaiser will be taking over in a few months. They'll be keeping their employees at least for six months and I expect they'll keep most if not all of those individuals working for them, delivering care on Maui for the foreseeable future. But we have this healthcare system where a lot of people call it a crisis. They say, how can I find healthcare? And in our last moments of the last segment, and you alluded to how difficult it is to find a doc. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be easier to find a doc on Maui now that Kaiser is taking over? Well, I, I think that certainly Kaiser does have a different model of providing care. So it will be able to um, bring in its physicians um, in a way that the state or government cannot. And part of that has to do with, for instance, our civil service system. If a yes. physician is an employee of the state, yes. uh, he joins the state government uh, system. Sure. And so that creates uh, more, I guess, bureaucracy and costs associated that, with it than, let's say, Kaiser has to deal with it. Um, so they're, they are going to have some more flexibility. And I think, obviously, because they're a national company, their access to specialties and physicians and ability to bring people from the Moana Loa Clinic yeah. onto Maui is going to be uh, different. Now, I will say the physicians that are already working there, I, I don't think that Kaiser is planning anything startling or different. They're yeah. going to, care should continue. Um, if we close on June 30th, the care should be no different on June 30th than it is on July 1. Right. Um, so it, it, you shouldn't, people shouldn't experience a big change. Right. And, and they, um, they provide a lot of good services too. Like in my community on Big Island, they just opened a, you know, a very large, like a 40,000 square foot facility where mm -hmm. Kaiser has a lot of providers and they bring people in and out. I, I mean, I've been saying for years that people have to realize that because we're an island state, there are certain nuances. One is you, not everyone can be the expert in a discipline. So mm -hmm. each region is going to have to choose over time and evolve to become its own center of excellence. So sometimes you'll get the very best oncology care, say, on Oahu. Mm -hmm. But 
you may get better orthopedic care in a different region and there may be times when you travel or when your provider mm -hmm. travels back and forth so Kaiser is kind of uniquely positioned mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. uh, what about the other regions uh, back in on Big Island Kona and Hilo those boards have also talked about perhaps pursuing partnerships mm -hmm. is that in the cards are we you know pausing to see how it works out what's your feeling well there's a combination combination of things going on I think um, What's going on with uh, the Maui and Kaiser transition is it's never been done before. Right. Certainly uh, not to the extent that, you know, as large as our system is here. Yeah. Um, it's a really new and different thing. And it, it is a complex process. It, it's not a simple sort of acquisition, if you think of somebody buying a business. Right. There, there are so many... Uh, federal regulations and state regulations and uh, that the process is, is is difficult and complex and so I think I don't think people are pausing but I think that people want to be able to focus on this transition so that we can figure out what works yeah and I imagine since it's never been done before we're going to discover that some things did not work yeah and we want to be able to take that knowledge and um, I, I think we're all confident that at the end of the day it's going to work. It's right. the details that we may want to change. So I think that uh, we're going to watch this process. We're going to work through it. And um, absolutely, um, the, our two regions on the Big Island, West Hawaii and East Hawaii, are interested in uh, seeing if there is another a transition that they can make as well that's similar to Maui. And what we'll be able to do next legislative session is take what we learned with Maui yeah. and and make it hopefully even a, a smoother ride than it has been so far. Yeah. Um, they are both interested. They have been talking to different partners and I think they've talked uh, in the press about that. So that's not unknown to people. Right. Um, what those entities can bring to the big island for people to think about is uh, sort of, um, if you think about the economics, the scale of what they can bring, if you think about uh, the Adventist system who had been talking with uh, Hilo, the yes. Hilo side, um, they're a large organization and they are a large organization that works in rural areas. Right. So what they can bring to a rural community is really unique and different than perhaps what another facility could, or another entity could bring. Right. Um, so. I think what the Big Island is looking at right now, what, what they, their emphasis is, knowing that down the road, yes. if their communities can sustain a private operator, that that would, that would probably be the best direction because it, we think that it, healthcare can be even better and the access to different kinds of specialties can be even greater yes. with a private operator. In the meantime, though, um, they, they are really getting to work on a number of fronts. Uh, really important is, is that they are trying to bring their communities in to have a discussion with them, this sort of wonky discussion that we're having about what should a, a community expect in terms of their health care. Do they want safety net or do they want something beyond safety net? Right. And can they sustain something else? And so they're going to pull in their communities. They're going to talk with them about it. They're going to try and generate yeah. a real community, I guess, decision-making process, which is what we saw in Maui, right? right? After years, the Maui community was clear where they wanted to go. Right. And it's in its infancy still on the Big Island. And so I think that that's what their focus is going to be. Yeah. The other thing is, is our facilities have been working really hard to live within their means, to work within their budgets, and they need economically to be in good shape for a private provider to even walk through the door. Yes. And so they're working really diligently to balance their budgets, to maintain their services, maintain their employees, and still be able to um, function without having to keep coming to the legislature for gap funding. And my understanding is that the ask is much more modest this year, m more than in any recent years that I can recall. Yes, we're asking, uh, this year we've, in our budget request, we're asking for $21 million, which um, would be 
in addition to the base that we got in the biennium budget, yeah. so from last year, originally we had planned to come in with a $47 million ask. Yes. Um, with Maui leading the system, we've been able to reduce it to $21 million. Um, and we will not be asking for an emergency appropriation, which has not happened in many years. Yeah, I've sponsored any number of them, so and happily, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, our, my understanding is we're not anticipating significant changes in the workforce right now. It looks no. like we've had a great, strong workforce, people very, just mm -hmm. wonderful people, devoted to care of patients in each of our communities, and we think we'll be able to retain them. Yes. It's been a painful year, though. As, as you're aware, we did have to go through a reduction in force uh, this year, and so um, I think uh, that affected, some. I think, around 150 of our employees. 2015. Yes. Yes, okay. And um, and through that process, it, it was really a painful process for everybody involved. And um, and the the regions are small communities. Yes. There's everybody knows everybody, and sure. and everybody's like a family. So it was a very painful process, um, and it wasn't taken lightly. Mm -hmm. The goals that the regions were looking at were, what services do we need to be providing, yes. and if we need to make cuts or reduce anything, let's make sure we don't reduce those crucial services that we have to have because it's a safety net. There's no place else to go right. to get it. Yeah, that dialogue and that question about what is an essential health care service, it comes back every year. And mm -hmm. even this year, I have, you know, I have spent some time thinking about it. And we all know that uh, OBGYN services and general medicine services are essential. They're the core mm -hmm. of services but also psychiatric services mm -hmm. in this day and age where it's very, you know, very difficult. A lot of people have challenges with mental illness. Um, even I could, I could envision a time in the future where drug and alcohol treatment could very well end up on our radar as, as essential health services mm -hmm. because so many people struggle with those problems, pediatrics, on and on. So uh, as we go down this road with partnerships and kind of the evolution, you're really describing the evolution of the Hawaii Health System Corporation. It'll be fascinating to see what we look like five years from now and mm -hmm. how people define these essential services, how people define uh, what the safety net is. Right. Now, in our last few minutes, um, if you had a crystal ball, what would you like to express? What do you think we're going to see in the next two, three, five years for our healthcare safety net? Well, um, certainly there is an effort to transition out of have the government transition out of uh, providing, um, you know, running acute care hospitals. But that's a, that's a long process. That's not going to happen overnight. And, uh, and there may be some communities where it's determined it's just not the right thing to do. Yeah. So HHSC is going to continue to exist um, somehow, but we will evolve. And um, where we don't have private operators and private providers coming in, then you're going to see things um, finding new ways to provide health care. And Kona is actually a great example. They've just started their telepsychiatry program where uh, because there's so few psychiatrists to work in their uh, emergency room, yes. uh, they actually now have telemedicine so that there's a psychiatrist available 24 hours a day to talk with the patient. Uh, yeah. it, it's, that's the kind of evolution that we're going to see is our communities finding new ways to continue to provide really important health care um, to our communities. And they're, they're going to be creative and they're going to keep working to do that. Okay. Well, I'm very excited to ride along your side. I'll, I'll be in the trench, I suppose, taking care of people in the ER. I'm excited to see how healthcare continues to evolve because Hawaii has been uh, one of the leaders in healthcare. We are the healthiest state once again this year, and in no small part, that's because you guys provide very essential services to so many, especially on the neighbor islands. So thank you. Great. It was great to see you. You too. This has been Josh Green, Healthcare in Hawaii, talking about Hawaii Health System Corporation with Ann Lopez. Thanks for joining us.